Let's go to master plan. Where am I going to start reading today? Somebody tell me. Acts what? There you go. Thank you. You get an A today. Let's go to Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42. We've been learning the master plan. It has been an exciting journey. Every week we're learning something new. Why do I call it the master plan? This is how the church began. I am constantly in awe when I read the book of Acts, one of my favorite books in the Bible, to watch the gospel march across the known world. Listen to the words I'm using. Not every place in the world, transportation limited them to some far-flung areas, but listen to what I'm saying. The gospel reached the entire known world in that day in one generation. In one generation. No mass media, television, radio, uh, there was no internet, there was no social media, there was no printing press, there was no electricity, there was no mass transportation. Think of this. In one generation, fearless, bold, courageous, passionate men and women spread the gospel to the known world. And one place in Acts said, these are the people who turned the world upside down. You know what? This world is upside down right now, isn't it? Isn't our culture upside down and backward? Well, why don't we turn it upside down, which means it's back where it ought to be right now. That's cool, okay? Why do we do that? We're seeing, are we healthy? Are we on track? What's my blood pressure? What's my heart rate? What's my, what's my weight and body mass and, 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 and my, uh, you know, my, my uh, fat level and stuff? Gee, that's scary, isn't it, to, coming into the holidays and all that? So we're saying, am I doing okay? Am I healthy? If I'm not, I need to change some things. What we're doing here, we're looking at to, to mutate away from its original power and focus. And we're seeing some amazing things individually and the church collectively. So let's begin in Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves. Notice it there, the very first brush of, of, of faith in Christ, of walking with him and walking together, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Their core values. Let's keep reading. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs and wonders were done by the apostles. That is supposed to be going on to this day. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need, incredibly, supernaturally, in unity and generosity. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. There was corporate worship, which should be part of church life. And they broke bread in their homes, smaller meetings in their homes where they got together. What happened? They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. What kind of people were they? Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Listen to your pastor. Connect with me here. And what was the bottom line of that master plan? And what was, is, and always will be the bottom line for God? Read it with me right here. What's the last sentence? Read it out loud. What? And the added to their number daily those who were. That's God's bottom line. That's Chris, everything you can imagine. We're going to have to build some things, and you can help us do that. But why do we do that? And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Now, we've been studying this passage, but I want to go to the very first one today. And, and, and I'll not get this completed, but we're going to start uh, working on something vitally important. I am critically concerned about this core value in our lives individually, in our lives collectively as a church, and in the body of Christ at large in, in the Western Hemisphere. Very concerned. Are we here? Look at the very first thing. They devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves. The very first priority. I want you to get this. It, this has almost become a byword. It's a duty. It's a checkoff. It's part of my routine. And we're losing the dynamic of the Word of God. The first priority was the apostles' teaching. Teaching. Teaching the Word of God. The apostles were teaching and teaching and teaching. The disciples were receiving and receiving and learning. The lifestyle of that church, think of its dynamic, that could change a world and a generation, was devoted and had foundation 
on the Word of God. Today, if you go to somebody, you'll say, you know, how do I grow as a Christian? Well, read your Bible and pray. Well, what does that mean? What, what, where is its value? How do we honor that? What do we understand about that? So I'm going to take you through a lot of scriptures, okay? So stay with me. I want to lay a foundation here. Vitally important. I believe God is going to resurrect a passion for the Word of God at Calvary today. How many can say amen to that? Now, we're a church that preaches the Word every week. You know we do. But I believe God wants to stir that up. Maybe you've never fallen in love with God's Word. Maybe you've never put it at the place of honor or understood its value. I want to help you see that today. This, is, this can transform your life. All right? We're going to make some very practical application. So let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Here in this, in this setting, Jesus has died on the cross for the sins of the world. He has been raised from the dead three days later. He is now interacting with the disciples, preparing them for his departure back to heaven. Now watch the assignment of the church. Here's our marching orders. This is called the Great Commission. This is what we do. This is who we are. So he says, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Say hallelujah for that, right? Aren't we thankful? Now watch this. That's the frame work. I have all authorities given to me. He said, okay, watch. So what do we do? Church, go and make disciples of all nations. That's what Kingdom Builders is all about. It's not just giving my money. It's a lifestyle. What do we do? How do we make disciples? baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Watch this verse. And what? What? Teaching. That's the assignment. Teaching them to obey what? Everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That's our marching orders. That's what we do. That was the devotion of that early church. There was a passion a dynamic in the Word of God. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul is at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry, this great missionary apostle. God used him through the Holy Spirit to pen two-thirds of the New Testament epistles. And now he's getting ready to hand the baton to Timothy and the next generation. Watch this verbiage. Critically important. What is he telling? This is his final summation. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 is, is Paul's swan song. It's his... Final words we read from him, okay? So what does he tell them? What do we do? First thing, what? Preach the word. Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared in season, out of season, to do what? To preach the word at all times. Listen, this is not just for pastors. This is not just for the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. This is the church. Now this is why, let me tell you, be quite honest, I want to be very clear. In nothing I say today, am I intimating or do I think that we know more at Calvary than any other church? That I know more than any other pastor? I learn all the time. I'm learning at all times. I listen to other sermons. I read books. I love to learn. I value my fellow ministers and in the fivefold ministries. I honor and respect that. But if we look at the church as a whole, that's what I'm saying. The word, the word, is sliding out of its place of preeminence. I'm concerned that in many places there is very little depth of Bible teaching and preaching. What we have is a lot of cultural interaction. We've got a lot of whiz, bang, and show, but do we have enough foundation in the church today? And let me tell you why there may be a dearth, a weakening of the preaching of the Word in the modern Western church, because watch what happens. When the word goes, you ready? This should be a blessing. It, it will tell us our spiritual place. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Look at that. What happens when we get the word? Correct. Oh, we don't want that. I didn't go to church to get corrected. It's kind of like I learned over, after I did pastoral counseling for a few years. You know what I discovered? People didn't come to me for advice. They came to me for approval. Do you understand what that means? They didn't want me to tell them what to do. They weren't asking me what I thought. They told me what they were doing. They just wanted me to say it was okay. Everybody with me? Okay, hold on your seat. It's going to get better. What happens to the word? What does the word do to us? Correct. Look at that next word. Rebuke. You rebuke somebody in church nowadays, and, and, and they can't get out the door fast enough. I don't feel the Holy Spirit at that church anymore. 
That pastor doesn't teach the word. You know what's funny? You know what's funny? Because you got to make up a spiritual excuse to run away from where you're supposed to be. Everybody still with me now? Somebody's got to tell the truth. You have to make a spiritual sounding excuse to run away from where you're supposed to be. So not everybody. God leads people to different places. But sometimes people leave when they shouldn't leave. And so what do they usually say? Watch, this is a funny thing. They're just not preaching the word there anymore. No, you know the reason why they left? Because they were preaching the word. And they got corrected and rebuked. And they said, I'm out. Okay, don't shout me down. Is everybody still with me? Okay, breathe. We're in church. We just breathe. It's all good. But what happens? You're encouraged too, aren't you? See, you're encouraged because it's the word. With great patience and careful instruction. Let me ask you the question. Have you ever been corrected or rebuked by the word when you're reading the word? Man, I have. Come on, tell the truth. Have you ever been reading your Bible? You're like, my God in heaven. I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry. Boy, that attitude got the spotlight on it. Tell the truth. Tell, you know, I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm the pastor. And I, I said, excuse me. I get on my knees. God, help me get this thing right. That's the power of coming. Are we there? Look at verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. There's a whole lot of teachers in the world today, but not enough teaching. Okay, let's go to the next verse. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Wow. Do I have five? But you, what do we do? Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. Teaching, teaching, teaching. Let me go to John 1 1. Let's go there. Let, let me show you some things very quickly. I, I want you to see the value of this. So, why is teaching so important? Because there's nothing to replace the Word of God. How many heard what I just said? There is no replacement for the Word of God. It is not a ritual, it is not a duty, it is your interaction with God Himself. Watch this. In the beginning was, see the capital W, that's, that's intentional. As you look to an authorized translation of the Bible, when these words are capitalized, that's a title given to God. No other time is that used. You, that's consistent through authorized translations that the titles given to God be given the capital letters, okay? So watch this. In the beginning was what the? Where? In the beginning was the Word. Look at this. And the Word, somebody's been given a title here was with God, and look at this, the Word, the Word was God, speaking about Jesus Christ. So the Word is God. We just read that, you know, God and His Word are one. God and His Word is one. I want you to begin to look at this, this, this Bible, whether it's a book or a device you have, God and His Word are one. God's Word is God's will. How many heard what I just said? How do I know? What do I need to do, Pastor? Tell me. Help me, guide me. God's word is his will. God and his word are one. Do you know that when you read this word, you're interacting with God? When you study the word, you're interacting with God. God and his word are one. Look at this next one. I want you to look with me in 2 Timothy 3, 16. I'm taking you through some steps. We're building something. Watch this. I love this scripture. All scripture. How much? All, All scripture. Let me help us with something very quickly. This is what you'll hear today if you're, if you're not paying attention. See, there is an attack against the authority of God's Word. In our culture and even in the church today, at large, the Word of God is being lessened. Why? Why would the church weaken, water down, or dilute the Word of God? So that man could do what he wants to do. So it wouldn't correct us or rebuke us or make us do right. All right? So, so here's what you'll hear today. You'll hear this term. The Bible contains truth. That sounds okay, except it's wrong. The Bible doesn't contain truth. The Bible is truth. What do you mean? Well, pastor, you mean everything in the Bible is true? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's the Word of God. It's a matter of faith. But there are many ways to prove it. I, I, you know, uh, pr the prophecies. Think of this. You know, the, the, here's what we learn. Uh, we find, and, and statisticians have done this work, it has to be done with, with uh, uh, you, you have to have some computer programs to do the math. It's so amazing. There are over 300 prophecies. Let me just give you one or two things. Three, over 300 prophecies about the life of Christ, that God would come, put on our flesh, be born of a virgin, walk on the planet, do these things, die on the cross, raise from the dead three days later. There, there are over 300 prophecies throughout the Old Testament prophesying, telling that would happen. Watch this. The fact that one person in the whole span of the human history 
fulfilled all 300 of those prophecies in one three in one 33 year period are you ready one man all 300 33 year period do you know what the odds are that was random you want, you want a number the odds that that could happen accidentally is one not million not billion not trillion that's pretty scary not one in a trillion one in a book this size one followed by 10 pages of zeros there's no number description there's no word for that the odds are you getting what I'm telling you that that randomly could happen is one times 10 pages of zero in other words it's absolutely impossible that that could have randomly happened God did what he said this is the Word of God. God watches over His Word. God and His Word are one. When God says He's going to do it, He does it. You can count on this Word. This book doesn't contain truth. This book is truth. You're with me? It's truth. Now, let, let's watch this. And it says all scriptures God breathed. So when you come to the Word of God, this is, not a, this is not a religious ritual. This is not history. This is not Greek mythology. It is not Jewish fairy tales. This is not just something that came to be. It's documented again and again and again and again. And what we're finding is the Bible says this scripture, all scripture, was God breathed. That meant God's life. The Spirit of God Almighty, the same term in Genesis when God formed Adam's body out of the dust of the earth and it's a perfectly formed body but no life he bent down and breathed into his nostrils his life and Adam came alive the same thing God did as the Spirit of God prompted these authors he breathed into his word and every word in your Bible has the very breath of God himself in that word when you read that word God breathes on you when you memorize that word God's in you God breathed on his word this there's nothing like it anywhere and isn't it interesting look again what's it useful for what teaching what happens when we study the word then we might get rebuked and we might get corrected and we might get trained and we might become righteous hallelujah what you think that's a that's an amazing thing the Word of God this word has no substitute there, there there's nothing else like this it it's the Word of God let, let me push on I want to go to first Peter chapter 1 verse 23 I want to look at it first in the King James translation look at this this is amazing you need to, if you don't understand if you don't study you don't know what you have with your Bible look at this look at this being born again not of what corruptible, corruptible is something that can decay and die so we are born again, not out of a corruptible seed, but out of what? Incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Do you understand what you just read? The word of God is incorruptible. The word of God cannot die. It can't go away. It can't be burned or destroyed or mashed or eliminated. So we were born again, what? With the incorruptible word of God. Do you realize it is the seed of God's word that placed in your life when you hear the word, when you study the word, when you say the word, the devil can never do anything to destroy that word. Sometimes we disobey it or we rebel or we hide or run from God and it gets covered up but you can't destroy that word let me let me show I grew up in church how many of you grew up in church this is South watch this that's what I thought all right I hope most of you weren't like me I had a period of time in my life where I turned my back on God ran away from God ran away from the church turned my back on everything I was a prodigal son in every stretch of the imagination I I, I, I had nothing to do with God didn't want it because I wanted to do what I wanted and I felt convicted I ran away from God but guess what I came back anybody ever I hate sometimes truth's good for us anybody ever did what I did anybody ever grow up in church and got away but look you're here aren't you why why are you here why did you come back what did what happened that you didn't know you know all those years you were sitting there mad at mom and daddy for bringing you to church you sitting there acting like a knucklehead you know what I'm talking about the preachers preaching guess what's happening word 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 you're thinking about the football game you're thinking about Mary Sue and Sally Mae and... but you're the word the word the word the word the word 
The devil tried to kill it. The devil laughed at it. The professor told you it's bunk. And people said you can't trust it. It's baloney. It's just one of the other books. But you know what happened? Something happened. The word can't die in you. And the word can't go away from you. And the devil can't squish it. And finally, the Spirit of God brought me to a place in my life where that which had been put inside of me, the devil couldn't kill it. And it became life in me again. And I was born again. And I came back home. And it saved me. And it changed my life. Do you know you need to train your children in the word of God? Please give them the word. Please put the word in them. It's your job. It's not the church's job. It's our job to help you, but it's your job to raise those children. Put the word in them. Put the word in them. Now listen, if they're five years old, don't have an hour Bible study. You're not that good. I don't hurt anybody's feelings. They're five years old. Give them a verse. Make it fun. Don't get them and say, all right, we're going to have devotion. And you're going to be still. You hear me? Quit moving around. Oh, that makes me want to learn. What do you got to say? I mean, I'm excited about that. Is that what God's like? I'm out. Put the word. Put the word. Put the word. While you're driving, while you're going, the Bible says teach them when they get up. Teach them when they go down. Talk about it. Write it on their heart. Let it be part of your life. Witness to them. Talk to them. Tell them the word. This is the word. This is the word. This is the word. Put the word. It's incorruptible. The devil can, listen, you can kill me, shoot me, burn me, blow me into a thousand pieces, but you can't kill the word of God that's inside my life. It's incorruptible, undeniable. It's stronger than Batman, Superman, Iron Man, Thor. Who's the guy that killed half the universe? Thanos. It's bigger and badder than all of them. Can't kill the word. Somebody needs to make a Marvel movie about the word. I'm in on that one. Come on. The whole world blows up. There's the word. Come on. Look at the Passion Translation. Look at this. Look at this. For through the eternal and living word of God. Guys, get this. It's not just some little book. This is the word of God. Eternal. Through the eternal living word of God, you have been born again. This seed that he planted within you can never be destroyed. But live and grow inside of you forever. Dear God, look at this. God in his word are one. God breathed in his word. It's eternal. It's powerful. It's undeniable, unshakable. Nothing can kill this word. Now, let's look at this. I got to hurry. Isaiah 55, 11. I'm laying some foundation here. Look at this. I love this. Look at this. So is my word. This is God speaking. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. Look at this. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Do you know what that means? God's word is at work at all times, 24-7. The word of God is working, 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 working. God said, if I say it, it's going to come to pass. It's not going to come void. It's not going to come back to a place where, where we can't see that happen. So, so we need to understand the value of this. Let, let's, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I want you to see that it is the word of God that builds our faith. It's the word of God that builds faith. Watch this. Hebrews 11, 1. What does it say? Look at this. This is New International Version. Now, faith is what? Confidence in what? What? We hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I want to make everybody happy. Give you a moment. Let's quote it from the King James because I know that you're more familiar, right? Come on. Won't that make you happy? Come on with me. Come on. Quote it. Hebrews 11. Now, let me hear you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Look at this. Faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of what's not seen. Now, some, some people would say, you faith people, you're, you, yeah, yeah, what, what do you mean? How do you believe something you haven't seen? Come on, watch this. How do you believe something you haven't seen? You, you're just, you're crazy. You're just, that's not intelligent. It's not, it's not, you know, 20, you know, it's not where we are. We're, come on, what do you mean? Well, let's look at this. Now, faith is what the substance, faith is the substance of what I'm hoping for. So when I'm hoping, praying, and believing for something, I'm not just shooting in the dark. I'm not just running around here wishfully thinking because the Bible says here, faith is the substance of something. It is the evidence of something. What's the substance and the evidence that you have while you're still waiting for it to become visible? 
this. I got the word. I've got the word. Let, let, let's think about this. What if somebody said, uh, they, you, you, you got some rich relative. You didn't know it, but you got a rich one somewhere. You wonder why they've been holding out on you, don't you? But let's say that you find them. And they say, hey, man, I'm so glad I'm your relative and you're my relative. I want to bless you. I'm, you know, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I live uh, up here in the beautiful mountains of, of Colorado, and, and, and I've got this beautiful home and overlooks the mountains. And you know what I do? I want to buy you a home. And you're like, really? Said, yeah, I want to buy you a home. Well, thanks, Uncle. That was nice. And, and, and so uh, they send you in the mail. You get a deed in the mail. And you start to show everybody. And, and, and you, say, you say, hey, you know, I got a house up in the Rockies. Really? Well, what does it look like? Well, I don't know. Well, have you ever been there? No. Well, you, you've never seen it? No. But it's my house. Well, you're crazy. What makes you think you got a house? Glad you asked. You, this deed came in the mail. I haven't seen the house, haven't been in the house, it's my house. So it's the evidence of what I'm hoping for. It's the substance of what I'm there for. Do you know that when you have this living, powerful, unchanging, can't be broken, eternal word of God, you have a deed to every promise that God has given you. And so when it's the substance of what I'm hoping for and the evidence of what I've not seen, I'm not crazy. I've got a deed. I've got a promise. It's the word of God. Go to verse 6. Let's look at this. Why is this important? Look at verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Who wants to please him? I want to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God for anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. I believe he exists. Anybody with me? And I believe that he what rewards those who earnestly seek him. We have faith. Now, let's go to Romans 10, 17. I'm going to try to bring this together. Look, You ready? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing. Stop. Let's say it again. So then faith cometh by hearing. Hearing and hearing stop. What are you saying? What did you just say? How does faith come? How does my faith grow? Where does this thing that pleases God come from in my life? By doing what? By hearing and it wasn't one time. You see the point I'm trying to make? Let's read it again. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing. So then faith cometh by hearing and and hearing. Come on, I don't hear you. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing, hearing and hearing, hearing and hearing. So I might not have enough faith today, but I'm not through hearing. I may not have it yet, but I'm not done. So faith comes by hearing and hearing, hearing and hearing. If I read my Bible once a year, I just, huh. I didn't even hear. You just, huh. How much word do you have in you? How much Bible do you have in you? God and his word are one. His scripture is an imperishable seed. Do I love his word? Do I read his word? Do I memorize the word? Do I speak the word? Do I honor the word? Anybody with me in this thing? Do you see the power of God to transform, to change us, to, 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 to we hear? Do you don't look this word? So faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. This English word, word, in this setting is translated from her Greek word, rhema. This is what rhema means. Listen to the definition. That which has been uttered by the living voice. That which has been uttered by the living voice. When you begin to say what God says, when you begin to speak what God says, you have now released God into your situation. You have now caused your faith to begin to arise. There are going to be moments in your life and my life where I have to make a decision. Am I going to talk like George? Am I going to talk like God? Am I going to talk like what's going on around me? Or am I going to trust the Word of God? Let me tie it together with this illustration. Let's listen to this, and we're going to close. We'll pick this up again next week. Now listen. Joyce Meyer, who uh, you are familiar with, an amazing ministry, blessing millions of people. Many of you have heard her testimony. Some may have not. Joyce Meyer grew up in one of the most horrific situations I think that could happen to a person. She was sexually abused by her father over and over again. In my opinion, the sexual abuse of a child by a family member would be the most horrific crime I think that could be committed. So here's this lady, this young girl, broken, bruised, fractured. How is she going to ever see life right? How is she going to ever look at herself the way God looks at her? 
How was she ever going to have a relationship with anyone else after all of that? Well, she said by the mercy of God as she grew older, she met some Christian people and was saved and born again and asked Jesus in her life. But she said, although I was saved, forgiven, loved, accepted, going to heaven, my spirit sitting in church full of poison, trying to love my husband, full of poison, trying to make life work, full of poison, understand the power of the word of God, powerful God-breathed word. But she said, once I began to know that word, I began to read it and read it and hear and hear and hear. passage where, where the Holy Spirit said, I want you to think about marriage, about a woman engaged to a man. I want you to think about marriage to understand how God loves the church, how the church is the bride of Christ, how we're his joy, his love, his delight, his heart, his passion. The church is like the bride of a young man. She, she is his joy. She is his delight. She is his everything. There, was, there is no cost too great to pay. There is nothing he will not do. Whatever she needs, whatever is necessary, he will do that because it's his bride. He loves her. He wants her ready. He, he wants their life to be blessed. And so look at this. What, what does Christ say he did for us, his bride, to make our relationship with him the best it could be? Not poisoned, not broken, not shameful, not guilty. How do we get there? When you've lived and experienced what Joyce Meyer experienced, made her holy, how? What, what washed up with water through the word? Do you see that? What she could not do, what life could not do, this Bible, not just words on paper bound in leather, this Bible has the words of God. The words of God have the life of God, the breath of God, the heart of God, the power of God. And as she began to read this, not as a book or a duty, but as a letter from her, her beloved, as the word from the one who chose her, as the word from the one who looked at her as if nothing had ever happened in her life, who looked at her spotless and holy and clean like no one had ever violated her, who said to her, it's not what he said or what he did, it's who I am and what I've done and how I love you. And every time she read this word, it washed her memories and washed her memories and washed her emotion and washed her guilt and washed her shame until she came back on the other side after hearing and hearing and hearing and choosing to say, I know what happened to me, but God says I'm chosen. God says I'm his beloved. God says I belong to him. God says I'm righteous. God says I am holy. God says I'm adopted. God says I'm his beloved. God says he chooses me. And the power of the past was broken by the washing of the word of God. The word of God. I can't over exaggerate. I can't say enough to you. I can't uh, uh, emphasize enough my Beloved family, the word, the word, the word, the teaching of the apostles transformed men and women who had no idea what it meant to be born again into a mighty house of faith and grace and mercy. That's the word of God. It's the word. Oh, it's not just, you know, it, it, the, the pages. It's, it's there. Look, and, and, and don't, Pete, you're so kind. I never try to say I've got a problem in anything because your guy's going to try to solve it. You're just helping me. If I stood here today and said, I got a flat tire before I could get out there, somebody would be jacking that tire up. You guys are amazing. So I'm not asking. I don't want another one. But look at this. I mean, it's, it's in bad shape. I mean, look at the page. Is there, what happens? I'm going to get it rebound because I'm not going to get another one. I don't want another one. I like this one. This is like my fifth Bible, and I decided I'm not going to give it away again. This is... This is, this is my partner right here. And I walk with it and I breathe and I love it. It's God's word. How, do, how, do, how did we walk two years and more dealing with my precious little granddaughter who I would give her my eyes, my skin, my life. I would die in a second. I would wash my mind in the word. Wash my mind in the word. Quote the word. Walk the word. Live the word. Believe the word. Trust the word. Not there to walk with you. See, I've learned that, that if I take the word, the word's going to guide me. Proverbs says that the wisdom of God is greater than the riches of man. That if I have 
have the wisdom of God. I have something better than silver and gold. You can't buy this kind of wisdom. You can't inherit it. It comes from the Word of God. I want to say something. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to be mean, but, but, but I want to help you. Maybe I'm doing a little correcting and rebuking. Listen to me. If you've been saved 20 years, you're not a victim. It's time for the church to say, you will not victimize me anymore. When I think of you, I am... Pr- please, our musicians to come, please. We're going to pray and then we'll go. Please stand with me and, and give me a minute. I got a friend who pastors in Louisiana. Many, many, many years ago, he came and preached here as an evangelist, Denny Duran, and today pastors the church his father founded. And, and they, they, they're those good old Louisiana... Cajun folks. I grew up down in South Arkansas, and we're not far from Cajun land. I got a lot of friends there in those areas. And, and pardon my attempt at Cajun, but then he said his grandmother, little Cajun lady, never learned English, lived in those southern Louisiana, spoke Cajun French. <laughs> You'd have to hear it. And couldn't read, but she was born again and saved and loved Jesus. And Denny said one time before she went to heaven, she asked Denny, he said, I need a new Bible. Denny, he thought, why do you need a Bible, Grandma? You can't read. But you don't tell your grandmother that. If your grandma wants a Bible, what do you do? Good. So he got her a nice Bible, leather bound, had her name on the front, gave it to her. She was so proud. And he said, I came back a few minutes later, a few uh, months later, said, Pastor, her Bible looked like yours. It beat half to death. He only had it a few months and the pages falling out. It looks horrible. And I said, Grandma, what'd you do? She said, Shay, child. I can't read that Bible. But I get the Bible. I beat the devil over the head every day with my Bible. When he tried to come in the house, child, I'd say, Shay, you don't come in this house. I beat the devil over the head. Not the leather in the pages. It's a message in this thing. And you know, every time he tries to come in your house, get that word and beat that devil over the head and draw the line in the sand and say, this is enough. Because when you decree the word of God, I, I will, I'll teach you that next week. When you speak the word of God, you release God in that moment. You release God in that moment. Church, you can stand up today in your faith. You can speak the word of God and release heaven against everything hell has thrown against your life. And if Joyce Meyer can walk out of that awful hell hole Satan fabricated for her, you can too. Today, if you need healing, declare the word of God. Today, if you need release, you declare the word of God. How does it come? Hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. How do you get clean? When I was a little boy and, and, and doing playing like I did, and, and years later when I played football, I, I, I couldn't take one little quick walk through the shower. Get clean. You understand what I'm saying? It, it's just like, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing. Clean is clean by cleaning and cleaning. You ever, little boy, take a shower and your mom said, come here. She ever tell you, take a bath? She said, come here, let me smell of your head. Dog on her, mom. Smell behind your ears. Could you know how little boys are? Go take a bath. I'm clean. Let's get out. And you're not very clean. I don't think you got clean. Hey, how many are ready to say, I've suffered enough? I'm drawing the line. I'm not going to let you victimize me again. My faith is going to grow because I'm going to hear and hear. And I'm going to watch and wash. And I'm going to read and read and read and read and speak and declare until the things that held me are off me right now in Jesus' name. Come on. Are you ready to start the journey? I don't want to make anyone feel bad, but if something hasn't changed, it needs to change. What's your freedom worth? How hard are you willing to work? Let, let, let's take it. Let's, let's, let's be in charge. Let's stop living like we can't do anything and start realizing God can do all things in Jesus' name. I want to go back to that little short verse that we sang earlier when it says, when I lift my voice and shout his word, walls fall down. When I open up my mouth and do what? Say the word. Miracles begin to happen. The word. Somebody say the word. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters, what did God say? And if I will say what God says, we're going to get there. 